Hi, my name is Peter Chin Hong, and I'm an infectious disease physician and faculty member at UCSF. Today, I'm going to give an overview on HIV prevention. Here's our pathogen map, again, that we've discussed time and time again. And again, here is HIV. These are our learning objectives for this module. We're going to describe strategies that are effective in preventing HIV in the U.S. and internationally, and define prophylaxis and recognize some of the common strategies to prevent opportunistic infections. Let's start with strategies that are effective in preventing HIV in the U.S. and internationally. Before we review some of the prevention methods for HIV, let's recap how HIV is transmitted. We know that HIV infection can occur with mucosal and parenteral contacts, such as in the case of injection drug users, as well as in utero and intrapartum, for example, in breastfeeding. Research has shown that sexual transmission of HIV is enhanced if there's a high HIV viral load in uncircumcised men in vaginal and anal intercourse, in unprotected intercourse, of course, and if there's a concomitant uh, sexually transmitted infection which could either be ulcerative, like syphilis, or non-ulcerative, like chlamydia. This slide presents a summary of some of our prevention strategies regarding sexual contact, condoms, microbicides, and male circumcision uh, have been studied and are effective. For pre-exposure strategies, these include needle exchange and pre-exposure prophylaxis, which we'll talk a little bit about more in detail in the next slides or two. Related to this, there's also post-exposure prophylaxis, such as in healthcare workers who have had needle stick injuries. There's the idea of treatment as prevention, with evidence showing that treating the HIV-infected partner in serodiscordant couples can effectively prevent seroconversion and infection in the HIV-negative partner. Finally, prevention of mother-to-child transmission is an effective strategy that uses antiretroviral therapy and has prevented many children from acquiring HIV infection in utero. Behavior interventions such as counseling and testing itself have also been touted as uh, prevention strategies. Let's spend some time on three areas. Pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, treatment as prevention, and finally prevention of mother to child transmission or PMTCT. Pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP is defined as given an HIV-negative individual a pill daily, which is typically Truvada or Tenofovir and Tricytabine, to prevent HIV infection. In studies, this can reduce HIV infection by 44 to 90 percent, depending on adherence. Obviously, the more rigorously you adhere to the regimen, the higher the degree of protection, which was seen in sub-analyses. Currently, guidelines uh, offer PrEP, or pre-exposure prophylaxis, to HIV-negative individuals who are at high risk for HIV. And these include men who have sex with men, in general, uh, heterosexual individuals who have had multiple partners in areas of high HIV prevalence, uh, to partners of HIV-infected patients, and to injection drug users in treatment. Treatment as prevention refers to using antiretroviral therapy to suppress detectable HIV virus, which decreases the risk of transmission to others. There was a very important clinical trial showing a 96% reduction in HIV transmission if antiretroviral therapy was started at a higher CD4 count in the range of 350 to 500 versus waiting to start uh, antiretroviral therapy uh, when the CD4 count uh, was down to less than 250. So there's a survival benefit, essentially. So we recommend immediate antiretroviral therapy when possible, particularly for HIV-infected patients uh, who are in a stable relationship with an HIV-uninfected partner. What about prevention of mother-to-child transmission as a prevention strategy, or PMTCT? Without intervention, we know that the risk of HIV transmission is 15 to 45% via perinatal transmission. PMTCT programs can reduce rates of transmission by 92 to 99%, which is very dramatic. Uh, uh, what does the program entail? Uh, well, the program uses antiretroviral therapy during pregnancy and after birth, but there are other components of a successful program, not just the treatment, and these include rapid HIV testing because you'd want to know the status of mothers, uh, and if they're positive, offer them therapy, uh, family planning, uh, linkage to care, of course, and advice on infant feeding, particularly the role of breastfeeding uh, in this situation. 
Uh, let's close by defining prophylaxis and recognizing some of the common strategies to prevent opportunistic infections. So these are the common uh, opportunistic infections that we've previously discussed. There's PCP pneumonia caused by pneumocystis urovetsii. We typically uh, include prophylaxis for patients with a CD4 count less than 200, and we use trimethoprim, uh, sulfamethoxazole, septorobactrim. For toxoplasmosis caused by toxoplasma gondii, a parasite, um, we typically would institute prophylaxis if the CD4 count is less than 100, and for those who are serologically positive. Of course, uh, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole also covers uh, PCP, so those who have CD4 counts under 200 would already be on septra, uh, which would give them automatic toxoplasmosis protection. You would have to give them an alternative agent if they were uh, intolerant of septra, and that's the reason for the, that uh, you know, recommendation of CD4 count less than 100. The third opportunistic infection is histoplasmosis I uh, wanted to discuss. It's, this is caused by histoplasma capsulatum, uh, which is um, a fungus, or a dimorphic fungus. Um, this is offered to patients who live in endemic areas, such as the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley, Indiana, etc. And if the CD4 count is less than 100 and you live in an endemic area, uh, itraconazole is recommended. For disseminated MAC prophylaxis, and MAC is caused by Mycobacterium avium intracellulare complex, we would typically offer prophylaxis with azithromycin, uh, 1,200 milligrams once weekly for those patients who have CD4 count less than 50. So these are examples of the ways in which we use prophylaxis. Uh, equally important these days is when do you stop prophylaxis, and typically uh, after uh, three to six months of sustained uh, CD4 count above that threshold, uh, when we institute prophylaxis, we would typically have a conversation about discontinuing the uh, prophylaxis as well in these appropriate patients. Finally, what about vaccines? Vaccines that are always safe and should be given include influenza intramuscularly, not the uh, necessarily the, the nasomist, a TD or T CDAP, the pneumococcal 13 valent or PCV13, followed by the pneumococcal polysaccharide. PPSV23 vaccine, hepatitis B, and HPV. If there are risk factors, we'd recommend meningococcal vaccine, hepatitis B, and uh, Hib. And although varicella, zoster, and MMR are safe if the CD4 count is greater than 200, we still feel very nervous about using uh, these vaccines, which are live, attenuated in patients who have uh, suppressed immune systems with CD4 less than 200. Thanks a lot for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed this module.